Hello. In this video, I want to look at an insightful article by Mary Cross and Henry Lane and Roderick White called An Organisational Learning Framework from Intuition to Institution. It appeared in the Academy of Management Review in 1999. I wanted to cover this article to recognise an important area in strategic management, that of knowledge and of organisational learning. Now, there are many important articles that we could call the knowledge-based view of strategy, including well-known work by Robert Grant and Richard Langloss. However, I did want to concentrate on a dynamic view of exploring and exploiting knowledge rather than simply gaining advantage through possessing knowledge. So, knowledge and learning more as a dynamic capability rather than as a subset of the resource view in which knowledge is a key resource. So the flow of learning, not the stock of knowledge in the firm. In this article, the authors seek to bring together many different strands of the literature on organisational and individual learning. For example, the information processing view, product innovation, cognitive maps and bounded rationality. And as such, it is a nice introduction to this territory and prompts organisations to think strategically about how they might intervene. In the article, Crossan and her colleagues' focus is on strategic renewal. And in this, the tension that Jim March highlights between exploring new learning and at the same time exploiting existing learning. A dynamic that plays out across individual, work group and organisational levels in the firm. In the flow of learning through these levels, they see four social and psychological processes at work. Intuiting, interpreting, integrating and institutionalising. These make up what the authors call their four eyes framework. Crossan, Lane and White start by laying out how learning is gained by individuals and becomes embedded in groups and the organisation's systems, strategies and procedures, which in turn then affect what these groups and individuals do. So a feed forward and feedback cycle. In this, there's a progression through the different levels. Intuition is uniquely an individual process, although it's taking place in an institutional context. The recognition of new patterns and possibilities only comes from individuals. However, these insights need to be made sense of, and as this interpreting is explored with others, it becomes richer and starts to span both individual and group levels. Where action results, the interpreting process blends into integration. A shared understanding, a mutual adjustment is needed to accommodate change. The changes that are productive are deemed effective and are repeated. And eventually, repetition leads to routine and formalization in rules, procedures, and structures. These routines are enduring and exist independently of any one individual. In the next section of the article, the authors step through the four I processes in detail, starting with intuiting. Intuiting is the pre-conscious awareness of patterns and or opportunities inherent in our personal complex stream of experiences and how we unconsciously react to them. The authors distinguish between expert intuition and entrepreneurial intuition. With the first, the more we become an expert in something, the less conscious, deliberate and explicit our thinking becomes. Our response becomes the obvious thing to do. 
What we have learned has become tacit knowledge that is deeply rooted in our individual experiences. In essence, we are effectively exploiting our own past learning. We are on automatic pilot. Entrepreneurial intuition is less about subconscious pattern recognition and more about making novel connections, perceiving new or emerging relationships between things and discerning possibilities not identified before. Such intuition is the beginning of new learning, so it's exploration. But to start with, no language exists to describe the insight, even to yourself, let alone others. So it's difficult to share. As you start to attempt to interpret that feeling or hunch, images and metaphor play an important role. It's like this, or picture this to get across our point. Naming also has a major impact. As small differences early in the life of an insight and make enormous differences in where an idea or a company may end up. Imagine if Steve Jobs and Apple had used the metaphor of business assistant rather than personal computer. To us now, it's difficult to imagine a PC being called anything else. But when the idea was being born, this was a vague metaphor. It is with the emergence of language, metaphors and naming that the interpretation process, the second eye, begins. Interpreting is explaining through words or action, an insight or an idea to oneself and to others. So while intuiting focuses on the subconscious process of developing insight, interpreting begins picking up the conscious elements of the individual's learning process. Through this, an individual develops a cognitive map about the domain in which they operate. So a mental structure to code, share and decode information about the phenomena we encounter and how those phenomena link together. With an individual's cognitive map, the product of their experience, different people will interpret the same stimulus in different, often conflicting ways. So understanding is the result of how we filter and interpret the information we receive. It is a case of seeing when we believe it, not believing it when we see it. Here we can make important links to the idea of bounded rationality. Language also plays a pivotal role in the interpreting and developing of cognitive maps. Developing language enables us to clarify meaning and to explain to others. As such, interpreting passes learning from the individual level to the group level. So interpreting becomes a social activity that refines and begins to create shared meaning and understanding. The group, therefore, has an interpretive capacity, which is the function of how it is made up and its dynamics. As interpretation becomes embedded in the group, perhaps a work group, it becomes integrative. The subject of the third I in Crossan, Lane and White's framework. Integrating is the emergence of coherent collective action through mutual adjustment, even though still informal and ad hoc. For coherence, a shared understanding by the group needs to build, and this requires continued dialogue and conversation among the members of that community. In combination with experimentation and shared practice, a shared cognitive map evolves. For this to happen, the organisation's language must further deepen to reflect now the interconnected nature of group action. 
In this, stories are particularly important. They reflect the complexity of actual practice rather than abstractions you may see in manuals or what is taught in a classroom. Stories become the repository of wisdom and part of the collective mindset and memory of the group. The shared understanding drives experimentation and what is perceived as effective will be informally retained and repeated. With replication and consensus, especially with an increase in scale, formal rules and procedures may be established. Routines become embedded across the organisation. This is moving to the final I, institutionalising. Institutionalising is the process of embedding learning that has occurred to individuals and groups into the organisation. So with informal mechanisms such as systems, structures, procedures and strategies that ensure certain actions take place. Essentially, the learning is being captured in the routines and practices of the organisation and also in the investments it has made in resources, perhaps in the design of machinery. Others would call this the templating of knowledge. Thus, the knowledge becomes separated from the members of the organisation, retained even if they leave. So, the organisation's stock of knowledge is more than the sum of that held by its members. Day-to-day -day actions are now regulated by the formal routines and relationships in the organisation. So new learning occurs within the context of existing organisational learning. As it takes time for learning to transfer from individual and group levels, institutionalised learning can drift out of fit as the external environment changes. Therefore, a major challenge for organisations is to manage the tension between learning from the past, which it needs to exploit, and new learning that must be allowed to drive change and renewal. So getting the balance right between continuity and change is essential. Cross Anne, Lane and White next move on to demonstrate the relationship between the levels and processes they have defined using Apple during Steve Jobs' first tenure. Jobs, through the intuitive process, had insights upon which Apple was founded. He perceived new patterns about possibilities which were developed through a metaphor, the personal computer as a household appliance, one in every home. This had its origins in his personal experiences and cognitive orientation. But those initial images were necessarily vague and the language used to explain underdeveloped and often improvised. Interpretation through a group process of dialogue and conversation, for example with Steve Wozniak, enhanced and deepened Job's own understanding and cognitive map. As he, with others, experimented and explored, shared understanding and integration of cognitive maps occurred. Language gained more precision and there was mutual adjustment in action to bring coherence. Effectively, what Mintzberg calls emergent strategy. But growth challenged the reliance on informal processes and spontaneity. The informal conversations over coffee were no longer enough to coordinate the organisation. Under pressure from the board, John Scully was brought in to put in needed system structures and other formal mechanisms in the hope that learning could be more systematically exploited. It could be argued this may have gone too far. Formality appeared to hinder its ability to renew itself. So intuit, interpret and 
integrate new learning. The authors build on this example to highlight the tension between assimilating new learning and exploiting what has already been learned. Rather than focusing on one level or process, they push firms and researchers to consider the whole as a dynamic process. In this, they warn that two of the interactions are particularly problematic, that between interpreting and integrating, and secondly, that between institutionalizing and intuiting. Firstly, moving from interpreting to integrating requires a shift from individual learning to learning amongst individuals and groups. So taking personally constructed cognitive maps and integrating them with those of others to develop shared understanding. Many elements of an individual's understanding will be tacit. And there is a big challenge making that tacit knowledge explicit without losing its essence. So mechanisms are needed to surface and articulate the ideas and concepts of an individual. Also, other individuals' own cognitive maps and imprecision in language will act as filters on what meaning is conveyed. We hear what we believe. So often, shared understanding of new ideas will not emerge unless shared action, experimentation, is attempted to produce common experiences. The second problematic interaction is between institutionalizing and intuiting. Exploitation can easily drive out intuition, especially in an established organization with a high level of institutionalized learning. The language of the organisation, the dominant logic of the collective mindset and the investments that have resulted present formidable physical and cognitive barriers to change. For example, resource allocation processes emphasise track record, proven success and areas where knowledge is most developed and as such will inhibit new insights and subjective appeals for experimentation. As the external environment changes, structures, rules and routines that once exploited value from the logic and learning previously developed may no longer reflect changed circumstances. But they still focus individuals' energy and attention and the conversations and connections that can occur Hence, creative destruction is often required, or at least a setting aside of the institutional order to allow variation and from that new insights to surface and be pursued. Given the challenges, the authors stress the need to recognise the dynamic nature of the learning process and that flows can be constrained by bottlenecks and limits in the ability of the organisation to absorb new learning. Thus, balancing the need to exploit existing learning with the capacity to generate new learning is fundamental to long-term success and can be a source of competitive advantage. In this, there are many factors that can facilitate or inhibit the tuning of this balance. The reward, information and strategic planning systems, resource allocation and the organisational structure and its design. Managers need to use these levers to optimise the functioning of the 4i processes across the three levels. Cross, Anne, Lane and White finish the article by restressing this need for a systemic view in research and practice. They warn that compartmentalization, the focus on one level or on one process, may seem to bring simplification, but will disguise many critical issues 
as it underplays the tension between exploration and exploitation and misses the importance of the flows between the levels. So, what do we make of Crossan, Lane and White's article? Well, it is certainly a useful overview of organisational learning and how it links to strategy. And it alerts us to areas we may wish to dig deeper into, for example, into cognitive maps and value and rationality. It also points to some practical questions for managers, such as what are the ways in which individuals are exposed to new learning opportunities? Or how does the organisation facilitate dialogue and sharing of insights? How is knowledge codified and made available across the organisation? And how do we balance the needs of new learning and the exploitation of existing learning. So how are you using transfers and secondments? Um, what's your approach to hiring and to external scanning of the environment to expose staff to new stimuli and experiences? How do project teams, conferences, forums, networks bring people together to explore issues? How are you capturing, codifying and making available existing knowledge that exists in the firm via structures, systems and living policies? How are you tuning allocation processes, reward systems and culture to reflect both the need to exploit existing knowledge and generate new knowledge? The article also highlights the importance of the development of language strategy emerges in the interaction and dialogue within a firm. But new insights need a shared language to deepen debate and translate strategy into action. Hence you see metaphors and phrases gain specific meaning unique in the firm. For example, in one company I was involved the upper bit, left a bit strategy was a statement full of meaning within that firm at the time. So an article well worth thinking about and also a great introduction to a rich body of literature linked to strategy. Thank you for listening.